Speaking of things that are uh, difficult and confront us, uh, uh, we're going to talk about that today. Uh, I've kind of come here today in, in this mind as I was kind of going over my message. Uh, it's sort of a rally the troops Sunday. Uh, I do want to kind of get you fired up. I want to encourage you in the right direction, I hope, as we get into today's b- bad advice and then examine what's maybe better. Um, we live in a time that's often pre- that it kind of presents us uh, as believers with limited options, right? When, when, especially when it comes to conflict. We can win or we can lose. We can conform or be left out. Uh, we can fight or give up. Those are the options that are presented to us. And one popular piece of advice reflects this mindset. This advice kind of goes like this. If you can't beat them, John, all right, some of you are like, okay, I've heard that before. It's not new. Now, I think we can all agree that when people say that, it, it's usually in sort of a... Um, almost, almost all, kind of in a light way or whimsical way. When I hear that, if you can't beat them, join them. I see Yosemite Sam saying it to Bugs Bunny in a Looney Tunes cartoon. I mean, that's kind of what goes through my head. Some of you are like old enough, you know what both those things are, Looney Tunes and Bugs Bunny, and Yosemite Sam's really reaching, all right? Um, but that's, I don't think a lot of people take that advice as like very serious. However, it does seem to reflect uh, what many people often do when it feels like the tide of popular opinion, culture ideas crash against one's position, I would argue that while maybe not in one step and in one response, the church has done this, I think gradually over time, the church has done this in many ways. You got, how many of you know what I'm talking about, right? Now, I, I'm not going to spin off into the myriad of ways I think this has happened or the, or the areas where I think this has happened. That's not really the point today. But I think that is essentially what we're expected to do, to give in. And on the surface, you know, if you get that advice, it might seem practical. Like, why keep beating my head against the wall? Why keep fighting a fight I'm going to lose? You know, why do I keep, you know, just kind of, you know, um, feeling all this stress and strain and, and I could just have it easier? But as Christians, that advice, what we know is that it represents a false dichotomy, a faulty choice between only two options when God offers us a much greater path. So right at the outset, let's remember, this is really important, Jesus never conformed to the world. Amen. That was like kind of weak for some believers, right? Jesus never conformed to the world. He never conformed to the world. And here's the other thing. He didn't set out to be others in a worldly sense. He showed us a better way, God's way. And so today, we're going to look at why this saying is actually really bad advice and how we can reject the false choice it presents and embracing instead a life of faithfulness, love, and ultimately trust in God's sovereignty. That's where we want to go today. So let's begin with confirming with what we as Christians are indeed supposed to do, and it's this. We are to stand firm without compromise. All right, say that with me. Maybe we should read that together. Stand firm without compromise. That's something we're called to do. God calls us to stand firm, not conform, even when the pressure to compromise is great. How many of you know the pressure to compromise right now has never been stronger? It's never been more intense coming from culture. You need to compromise. You need to give in. You need to lay down your antiquated views and ideas. You need to stop holding on to what the Bible says. You need to stop believing what you're believing. You need, you need to start compromising. The world is way ahead of you. You're way behind. You need to give in. This is the, what's coming from the world today. And, and it's never been stronger. The saying, if you can't beat them, join them. Well, it encourages us to compromise our beliefs and join those who oppose us when we feel defeated or are told we should feel stupid for our beliefs. However, Scripture repeatedly calls Christians to stand firm in their faith without yielding to the worldly pressure around us. Now, it, 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 it doesn't matter how much we're outnumbered or outgunned or how much our voice is berated, belittled, mocked, or stifled. We, church, must stand firm. So, Scripture calls us, first of all, to be a people of high integrity, we are not to bend. We're not to give in. We're not to give up. I want to give you. Uh, I want to take a look at a passage we have been beating on, uh, uh, in, in the hopes that it gets in our hearts because repetitions of other learning, right? So we've been looking at this passage over and over again. So look with me at Romans twelve verse two. It says this: 
do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Uh, I want to look at that. That was in the ESV. I want to look at it in the NLT. It says it like this. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. Right? By changing the way that you think. It goes on. But I also want to share with you in the Amplified. How many of you have an Amplified Bible somewhere? Right? It was a really popular a long time ago. Some people are like, I would never pick up that Bible. That's okay. It's, it's a pair, you know, it, it, paraphrase, it tries to help us out. It, it just sort of unpacks it a little bit more. I, I appreciate it sometimes at getting ideas across. So listen to it in, in with this read. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed, and, and I like this clarification, and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in His plan and purpose for you. You guys getting a feel for the passage, or should I go through about five other versions, all right? I think, you're getting, I think you're getting it, right? I just want to show you the richness of that and what we're really being asked to do. The message is clear. Stand firm. Don't conform to the world. And the evidence that you are becoming spiritually mature people is that you conform to and agree with the world less and conform to and agree with the Lord more. Can I get an amen to that? And the more you agree with the Lord and His values and His attitudes, then the closer you will be to God's will and purposes in your life, and that is a good and wonderful thing. So not only are we here to never conform, but we're called to persevere, especially in the trials that life throws at us. How many of you know some trials, right? We all can think of some trials. We're going through some things. And what we're told in James 1.12 is this, blessed is the one who perseveres, this is the NIV, under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. The New Living Translation puts the first part like this. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. And when the world puts a squeeze on us, it is a test. And that little voice inside of us that tells us, just get along. Don't say the thing that's in your head. You know, don't cause offense. You know, and all of that. And, 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 and tells us to just agree with those. Just agree with them. The people that are putting the pressure on us, that is temptation. We are being tempted to come into agreement in order to relieve the strain and tension of all of it. But we will never be rewarded if we cave in and compromise. But if we withstand the test, if we endure to the end, then we shall be blessed in every way. But I want to remind us in this, there's so many pragmatic things we get caught up with but we should keep in mind that everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. Everything has got something behind it. Uh, 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 it moves towards God or it moves away from God. Very, very few things are necessarily uh, neutral. There's things that are neutral that get abused and, and taken in different directions, but, but things, all these things are spiritual in one way or the other. Behind every compromise and offer to uh, is and every compromise and every offer of the enemy to speak to us is an attempt to get us to do but one thing, and that is surrender. Give up, give in. Come to the place of common agreement on so many different things. And the enemy of our souls, what he likes to do is he likes to make um, inroads and, 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 and to our hearts and minds. Rarely does the enemy come along and just try to wholeheartedly persuade us to reject God on the whole, to throw them out of our lives. Rather, what the enemy loves to do is come on, a, he likes yardage, right? The enemy likes to come in and just move the chains, move the chains, move the chains. It takes us closer to his goal, and, and it does it step at a time, and we do it, and how it happens is one compromise at a time in our lives. One little, okay, sure, you know, okay, I'll let that go. No, okay, you know, fine, I concede, or whatever. It's not a bit, you know, one little compromise. That's how he moves the ball. He knows better than to come right at you and tell you, hey, Christian, reject and throw away your God. We're like, you're, no, right? I mean, no, that's ridiculous. But, you know, you're really offending these people. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I'll just be quiet. And I'll just not say anything anymore. 
you know, we could go on and on. And, and again, I'm, I'm avoiding getting into any examples because I think it applies so to so many dimensions and so many conversations. Anything the world puts up is a potential for this right in front of us. And so he wants us to get us to that place where, oh, you know, I agree with God's word on everything except fill in the blank. Oh, well, God's word is true except this is actually really outdated and that's not really what God would say today. Uh, I, I really believe in God and his word except, right, this is where he wants us to be. Did God, keep, keep, remember yourself, it goes right back to the original temptation. Did God really say? Did he really say that? I mean, did he really say you can't eat the fruit? I mean, really? I mean, is that really what he was saying? Ephesians 6, 13 through 14 reminds us of the spiritual nature of things. Because here Paul tells us to put on God's armor. He says this, put on every piece of God's armor so that you'll be able to, what's the word right here? Resist. And resist who? The enemy. What are we supposed to do? Resist. Who are we resisting? People? No. The enemy. The enemy, right? That's what we have here. And it says this. Uh, it goes on. The enemy in the time of evil. Are we in a time of evil? I believe we are. And then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. So again, the Apostle Paul says, hey, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the spiritual opposition that wars against our souls. In our battle, though, we should hear this. It's not about winning and it's not about losing as the world defines it, but it's about standing faithfully in God's truth. That's the victory, right? So when we feel the pressure to give in or, or join them, it's quite often rooted in the fear and belief that, well, we can't stand against the tide. We're made to feel, here, here's, here's the thing, we're made to feel as if we're crazy. We're made to feel as if we're out of touch or unenlightened or so much so that, you know, the pressure to feel to give up our ground is just nearly overwhelming. We are made to feel timid and fearful, but 2 Timothy 1.7 reminds us of what? Here's what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of, right, what, look at what he says, but a power, a love, and self-discipline. God equips us to stand firm in the face of opposition, relying on his power rather than our own strength. And here's what we get into, okay then, pastor, how is it exactly we are to respond? We are to respond with love always, not conflict. Did y'all hear that? Raise your hand if you heard that. All right. I'll, I'll keep saying it, right? This is a big deal. Because as of late in the world, we're not known because of our love. We're known because of what? Conflict. Now, it's okay to be known that we have a position that, that people don't like. That's one thing. But, but to be known because we raise conflict is not what we're supposed to be known by. We're supposed to be known by our love. So we need to learn to respond with love, not conflict. Christ calls us to transform our opposition through love, not to defeat others or conform to their ways. Right? And by the way, and I'll say this probably one more than once, loving people is not conforming to their ideas and their ways. There's, they've got nothing to do with love, right? Those are not mutually exclusive <laughs> ideas, right? We, 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 they're separate. They're independent of each other in this way. You could say that love doesn't drive us to conquer people, but, but rather love drives us to conquer and win hearts and minds. Very different things. Love will drive us to fight indeed for what is right, but not fight as the world does. Some of y'all, you like to scrap. And the problem is you like to scrap like the world scraps. And we don't need any worldly scrappers in the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus doesn't need you. He doesn't need that. He, need, he wants you, of course. But does he, want, he, does he want you scrapping with the world? Some of you, you could throw down. Like, I wouldn't want to get in. I mean, I'll just leave it right there. All right, I'll just leave it right there. Because uh, I don't want you know, think anyone, I'm calling out anybody. But you know who you are, right? You know if that's you. Are, what, how do you fight? Is your fight with love? Or is your fight with you know, just the same animosity 
and tension and stress and conflict and anger and frustration and angst. And I mean, is that, are, those, are those the weapons of our warfare, anybody? No, they aren't at all. You know, the, and the world may tell us that, hey, if you can't beat your enemy, you know, we should just join them, avoid the conflict, survive. But Jesus teaches a completely different way to handle opposition, and it is to handle it through love and grace, not combativeness or compromise. Well, Pastor Brian, what about this situation? What about this scenario? What if this were to happen? Yeah, and on and on we go, look, uh, there are caveat, caveats that, sure, we could explore. Um, what might our response be in this scenario? And what might Christ might say about a different thing, right? Sure, I mean, if we were to want to have a kind of a philosophical ethics conversation and throw up as many examples as we want, would we find some variation in how we might respond? Sure, because we are following the Word of God the best we can. But by and large, that's not our issue. By and large, we need to remember that we are to handle our opposition through love, right? And we need to love like Christ and not look for loopholes. Can I get an Amen. All right. Some of you all, you are loophole believers. You're looking for the loophole to hate somebody. You're looking for the loophole to chew somebody out. You're looking for the loophole. Don't be looking for the loophole. How about you look for love? How about you step out in love? There, that would be a wonderful thing to try. We need to remember, and uh, when it comes to our enemies, and we do have enemies, that we're called to love them first. Pray for them second. Right. bless them third, right? And we, we did a whole study on what we're supposed to do to our enemies. It would really disturb us. It would rock us to know what Jesus expects of us towards our enemies. And, and, and we have to be reminded of this because our enemies are really rearing their heads right now. And it's only going to get worse as the end of time approaches. It's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder to be a Christian in this world. Matthew 5.44 says, Jesus says, I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Now, rather than seeking to defeat or join those who oppose us, we're called to love them, we're, which creates this path for transformation and reconciliation. Remember, Christians are called to be peacemakers as far as it depends upon them. We are to be at peace with everyone. And Jesus shook up the audience a bit when his famous Sermon on the Mount, he declares, Matthew 5, 9, this is just um, in the same chapter as the previous verse, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. Of God. So Christians are not called to fight worldly battles or surrender to worldly ways, but seek peace and build bridges, reflecting the nature of God. And those who ch chose to, by the way, our God, He's the one who chose to step into this world. And what did the world do to him? The world hated him. What does the world still do? Hate him. And what did he do for the world that hates him? He still gave up his life in order to save them. Just so if they happen to choose to be reconciled with him, the, the groundwork has already been done. That's what he did. That's what he modeled for us. Right? Now just a, a few verses later after verse 9, Jesus calls us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Look at Matthew 5, 13 through 16. He says this, if you are the salt, or sorry, you are, not if, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. It goes on. Verse 15, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket instead a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Now, reread that last uh, sentence there. Does it say this? Does it say, let your good opinions, your strong arguments, and your passive-aggressive insults shine out for all to see? What does it say? Let your good deeds shine out for the world to see. You know, right? That, that's, that's the calling. Our response to the opposition should not be to, to join the darkness, and there's a Star Wars joke in there somewhere, but to shine brightly, right? Showing that there is a better way. It's God's way. And standing apart in love and truth can, what we should understand about that and, and, and is that when we stand apart in love and truth, it has a, an ability 
capacity to powerfully transform the heart to which it's expressed. It can be very powerful. It shatters perceptions of who we are and who Christ is when we do that. It makes Him real and, and as, as He is. And, and some might wonder, well, how in the world can we be both peacemakers and then add flavor and light? I mean, isn't salt salty? Isn't salt salty, right? Isn't light bright? I mean, won't people just be offended if we do the latter alongside the former? I mean, how, how do those coexist? But I want to encourage you, these two things are not in conflict, church. They're not in conflict at all. Being both peacemakers and holding up a standard for all to see is not in conflict. I mean, that's what we're trying to do, and it can be done. The key, I argue, though, is in our heart and our motives and the way we do it and our speech and our conduct because when those things aren't aligned, they betray us, right? And they confuse the enemy. They don't, they don't tend to speak to the enemy, and that's important for us to understand. And, um, and we also need to understand that if we actually and accurately represent Christ, What does he tell us to expect? No better than what he received. He said, you know, he's like, are you above your master? You think because, you know, I was persecuted, you won't be? Or that they hated me and so they're not going to hate you? Then you're fooling yourselves. If they hated me, they're going to hate you more. If they persecuted me, then just imagine what's waiting for you. You know, it it, that's going to come. That's likely, in many cases, going to be the result of you shining your light and being salt of the earth is it could create that. But here's the thing, and they'll think all kinds of bad things. All, all, all day long, Christians endure insults and accused of do, you know, having terrible hearts about people, accused of hating people, accused of being bigots, and now no, no, we go. Christians are accused of all these things day in and day out and day out, but it doesn't make them true. It doesn't make it true. I refuse to receive that. And here's the thing. If they know in their hearts it's not true, even if they say it, even if we're condemned for it, it will be like coals heaped upon their heads and they'll be reminded every day that they know the truth and that the only thing they've spoken is lies. And and, and that's on them and that's between them and their maker, but we have done our part. 1 Peter 2.12 says this, though, and I, I like this, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Be careful. Be careful. Some of y'all are not very careful. Right? Some of you all start conversations you have no business starting because you're just, you're just throwing gas on a fire and throwing a match in. Just see what happens. That's not what God has called you to do. Be, be thoughtful. Be careful. What does he say? Live properly among your neighbors. Unbelieving neighbors, he specifies. Then even, and again, and, and it could go sideways, But even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. How much honor do you think they'll give to God after having you chew them out and tell them off and scream at them your Bible passages? How much love will they give your God? How much honor will they give him? Right? Our speech and conduct betrays the mission. And we have to be so careful in this. But Jesus showed us, he showed us how. It's not like we're going about life aimlessly, church. He lived in such a way as to model how it might be done. And we know where the road leads, (laughs) where it can lead. And but he showed us how it can be done. So the encouragement here is to follow the example of Jesus, who was hated far more than we have been hated, who was abused far more than we've been abused and called far worse things than you and I have been called. And we are yet to follow his example. And here's, even, even, in, even in the worst of moments, even when he was being, even when he could have said one word to save his life, um, he never joined those who opposed him. Never. He did not engage in endless battles to defeat them with verbal arguments. He showed them love. He showed them grace. He spoke truth. And you guess how his victory came? Did his victory come there on earth in his ministry amongst the twelve? His victory came when he went to Calvary and was crucified and he stepped up out of the grave. That is where the victory was won. That is where the victory is won. Not through worldly triumph. 
winning the argument, choking out his opponents. Right? Can you just see Jesus there at the cross choking out the people? You know what I mean? That's not how it worked. You know, until they finally said, uncle, uncle, I believe, right? His victory came through sacrificial love that was poured out, Calvary, for you and for me and every unbeliever yet to become a believer. Pre-believers, I like to call them, right? For every one of us. And that is our model for responding to opposition. The third thing, final thing, and I think this is really important, on this whole bad advice thing, is that, you know, we need to learn to trust in God's sovereignty over outcomes. You could say this, God is in control in every battle, and His plans are greater than our strategies. Now, control, I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of using the word control. I use it because I think we understand it. But, but as I pointed out many times, God has authority over all the battles, Control is a different thing because actually the enemy has got a domain of control within this world right now, right? So uh, we need to understand, though, that nothing happens outside of his authority. There's a, it's, a, it's a small nuance of a distinction, but I always feel compelled to say something like that. But for, to make it easy for you in your notes, God is in control of every battle, and his plans are greater than our strategies. How many of you love to come up with a good plan? You love to work it out. You love to figure it out. If a problem comes up, you're like vanilla, vanilla ice, yo, you'll solve it, right? Th- that's how you think, that's how, that's how you like to be, you know, you, you are just wired that way, and, and, but you need to understand, God's plan is way, way superior to your strategy. Is, your strategy might be nice, it might be well, you know, it might be good-hearted, it might include loving some people, but it's still, whatever your strategy is, whatever you're working out in your mind, it, it's never quite as good as God's plan. So how about we learn to trust his plan? Because what I've learned painfully is God doesn't follow my strategies very well. I get a little upset about it sometimes. Lord, I did X, Y, Z. Now you're supposed to do A, B, C again. And, you know, and, we, and, and it's frustrating when God doesn't follow through on the things I planned for him to do. Well, it's because he's sovereign, church. Right? He's sovereign. We need to trust God's sovereignty over outcomes. You see, the false dichotomy in if you can't beat them, join them, it assumes, it assumes that the only way to avoid conflict or defeat is to compromise and align with those who oppose us. But as Christians, we know that victory isn't always about beating the other side. It's about trusting God's purposes will prevail in the end over all things, even when the odds are stacked against us. Come on, somebody. Even when everything's against you, when the odds are against you, right? I was the, that was one of the greatest messages. I guess I'm just nerding out on things. Like one of the greatest example, one of the greatest messages of Tolkien's writing that he wanted to impart to the hearts and minds of people is there is always hope because our God will work everything out in the end. We can hope in Him. We can have hope in Him, right? And if you don't, if you're kind of struggling with that, let, let's just have a little history review. All right. Uh, it, it just a broad stroke over some Christian history for you. I think this is really good in, in, in that we think about this because the survival of the early church, if we, if we look at that under the Roman persecution between the first and fourth century, we would learn a lot of lessons that we could probably uh, do well to learn today. The early Christian church, if you aren't aware of this, su- su- uh, uh, endured severe persecution under the Roman Empire especially under Nero, Domitian, uh, Diocletian. These were all horrible, horrible, horrible emperors. And Christians were often scapegoated. Do we get scapegoated today in our culture, by the way? You better believe we do. But probably still not yet to the degree that, degree that it happened to these early Christians. If there was a problem, it was pinned on them. They were, they were scapegoated for societal problems. They were arrested tortured, even executed, often in, in, as we are familiar with, in very brutal public spectacles. And, and when this is happening, these early stages of Christianity, Christianity is a very delicate, pivotal, pivotal point in history. And, and honestly, if you were to look at it you know, in the lens of that time, you would think this movement has no way of surviving. This is, uh, this is over before it really got off the ground. Like, it's going to get stamped out. Like, 
people, you know, no one wanted to become a Christian just to become a Christian. Like, you knew there was a very big risk that your life kind of would be over as you knew it because of the great persecution that was against him. And so uh, the spread of Christianity almost was unthinkable, and public opinion was quite often against it. However, despite this intense persecution, early Christians, they had this way of believing in God's ultimate victory in the end, that God was going to win. They believed his promises in Matthew 16, 18, as they stood there before the enemy, when Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And they had the nerve to believe it. They had the nerve to take God at his word. And a lot of martyrs went to their deaths with the hope of eternal life, knowing that their faithfulness would be part and serve God's bigger plan in history. And they chose to remain faithful. They spread the gospel. They formed underground church communities, confident that, look, God's going to triumph even when everything around them looks so bleak. I wonder, do we have that sort of confidence today? Do we have that confidence? And so against all odds, you know what happened with Christianity? Right? Christianity continued to spread bit by bit throughout the Roman Empire. And statistically, it spread faster than any myth or legend ever has in history. Exponentially faster to where only supernatural explanations can provide grounds for why it spread so fast. Wicked rulers, what did they do? Well, they died. New ones came and they died. And the faith that the Roman authorities tried to stamp out grew stronger and stronger, eventually becoming the dominant religion of the empire. And after Emperor Constantine's conversion and the Edict of Milan of 313 AD, which legalized Christianity, praise God for that. And, And right or wrong, there's a lot of interesting conversations around this, but some would say, some historians would say, well, the Roman Empire didn't fall as much as it became born again, right? Now, that is quite a transformation. Could you agree? And the bottom line is that the church not only survived in the worst of these times, it flourished. It impacted the course of Western civilization as we know it today, continues to grow globally now. Here's, here's what I want to say. Christian, we have never been in it for the short game. We're, we're about the long game. We're always about the long game. Christianity's always been about the long game. It's a different perspective. And we have this early, easy advantage where we know the end of the story. We know how it all ends. We know how it all works out. That, that gives us an edge. When it comes to the sovereignty of God, I have given myself to the trust, to trust in the sovereignty of God. Now, I'm not so good at understanding him and appreciating his timing or ridding myself of anxiety. I don't mean to say that. In fact, I trust in his sovereignty so much at times, I'm not quite sure how to pray. Because I want to pray for the good thing. You know, I want to, I want to follow scripture like, you know, ask your father who is heaven, right? And, and I want to pray that he, you know, that gives me the desires of my heart, right? And I want to pray that with right motives and I want to ask things. But at the same time, I'm constantly reminded of the sovereignty of God. So I would say more and more, the older I get, all my prayers typically include, or you know, as I'm, as I'm really seeking God is, but not my will, but your will be done. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Jesus who said, I really would rather not die, but not my will, but your will be done. It's the sovereignty of God. I trust in his greater purposes and plans. It's hard, but as you grow in your faith, you'll find out that everything's, everything's on him. Everything's under his authority. And so, whether it turns this way or that way, even if I prayed for this and got that, I don't want to be discouraged and I don't want to be. Notice I said I don't want to be because it's not like I always, you know, handle that well. I don't want to be discouraged by that because God is sovereign. I trust in Him. And we should grow in this. Right? Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. Remember what the prophet Isaiah declared or what the Lord spoke through him when he said, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. Your cute little thoughts, they're nice, but they're nothing like mine. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Ooh, that's, I'm thinking about all the thoughts we like to elevate and think, well, I know better than God. His word can't be right. You, you think your thoughts are higher than God's? Well, that's some, that takes some 
It takes some gall right there. That's pretty impressive. But the point is, God often works in ways that is well beyond our understanding. So instead of trying to win or trying to join the world's ideas, the values, or methods, what if we just trust that God is sovereign and his plans are perfect? And what if we just participated with those? And, and 2 Timothy 1.7, which we read earlier, reminds us that fear should not drive our decisions. Rather, we're called to trust that God can bring about change in his timing and his way. And even when it feels like we're losing, God is working behind the scenes. He's always working. He's always working. I song Waymaker, right? He's always working. Even when I don't see him, he's always working for his glory and his good. And if, and if his people will pray, then we have nothing to fear because as Roman 8, 28 says, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And, and I have to be reminded of this sometimes as well, and I think it would be good for all of us to hear this. Be reminded, God has a plan. It's better than your strategies. And you don't have to worry about his plan because God's plans cannot be thwarted. Do you believe that? Didn't we believe that today? Do you think the enemy can wreck God's plans? Some of you are looking at me like you're not sure. Nothing happens outside of what he's allowed to happen. The enemy can't wreck the Lord's plans. He he knows the enemy's move before the enemy makes a move. That's why we already know the end. And and in case you're worried about the the world around us, you know, the other people wrecking God's plans for the world, I I just want to encourage you this. If if you're struggling to trust the sovereignty, then let me give you five quick verses. I'm going to read them really fast. So there's five. Job 42.2 says this, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted, Job to the Lord. Isaiah 14, 27. The Lord of heaven's armies has spoken. Who can change his plans? When his hand is raised, who can stop him? Come on, Lord. Proverbs 20, 19, 21. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Daniel 4, 35. All the people of earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven, among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the things I've done in the past. For I alone am God. I am God and there is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will what? Come to pass. For I do whatever I wish. You, you worried about God getting manipulated by people? Come on. God will not be mocked. Ain't nobody going to pull one over on the Lord. Ain't no one going to trump his plans. No one's going to come and you know, take over things. For, like, no, God has got a plan. What he needs is his people to stand and be faithful. That's what we need to do. We need to stand with him and not run our own plans alongside him. We need to come into agreement with him. And remember what the weapons of our warfare are. They're not of this world. And we definitely don't have to join them. Come on. A terrible advice. Can't beat them, join them. Come on. Right? It's happened many times in history, of course. But So we say all these things. Meanwhile, American Christians are losing their minds over who's become, going to become president next. October 27th. Sunday, October 27th. You'll need to be here. And you need to bring your friends. Um, the final installment of the series is a message of bad advice. Bad advice that says don't mix religion and politics. It's going to be a TNT Sunday right before the elections. You need to come and hear more because we'll really get into it then. You need to, you need to come and make plans to be here. Um, we'll talk more about that. But if you're worried, if, you know, if you think that If you think your God doesn't have his hands over the elections of our nation, then your God is too small. I'll just say that. But we have to begin to change the way we interact with the world. We have to get better. We have to go back and relearn the early ways of the church. We will never win anyone to the Lord by holding a knife to their throat and threatening, you know, you know, that we're going to do this or that. 
the world to be changed by the power of his love, just like we were changed by the power of his love. Our call to Christians is not to win every worldly battle, but to remain faithful to God's kingdom. 1 Corinthians, Paul writes first in 1557, 1 Corinthians, but thanks be to God who gives us what? The victory. Say, say that with me one more time. Victory through ourselves. No, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our ultimate victory has already been secured and we only win the day through that victory. So hold on to an eternal perspective. As mentioned earlier, one of the dangers of the can't beat them join a mindset is that it focuses only on a short-term uh, worldly success. But as Christians, we're called to live with an eternal perspective. And admittedly, again, it's not easy. It doesn't, at least it doesn't come natural to me, but that's the perspective we need to have. Matthew 6, what does it say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All the things you're worried about in life, we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, put God first. All these other things will come into line around your lives. And when we prioritize God's kingdom, we can trust he'll take care of the rest in our lives. Even if it feels like we're losing God calls us to, to stand without compromise, respond in love rather than conflict, and to trust the sovereignty over every outcome. We're not driven by fear, we're driven by faith. God's plans are higher than our own, and his victory has already been won in Christ. So let's rejoice, uh, let's reject rather the, the false choice, is what I was trying to say, of the can't beat him, join him and embrace the higher calling to be faithful, loving, trusting servants of our God. Can I get an amen to that today? Church, will you bow your heads and hearts with me? There's a bit of a kind of ironic twist. There are still some of us that when it comes to our lives and the way we're living, we're still living as if somehow in the end we're going to beat God. <laughs> Some of us are kind of living in such a way that we think, well, in the end, you know, it'll, it'll be, you know, how I think I live this life and not how God knows I live this life. And if you're someone in the room today or watching online and really your life is kind of just living antagonistically or in or in rejection of or opposite to the life that God has called you to, can I just tell you, it'll never work. <laughs> I love you and that will never work. It'll never work. You just living the life the way you want and, and kind of living it in spite of what God says how we should live because we've already clarified He wins. His voice wins. His ways win. His plans win. And so you are kicking and pushing against the grain. You're pushing against the grain, and there's no peace in it. There's no joy in it. There's no satisfaction in it. And it does not end well. And I'm going to encourage you today. If you're trying to go against God, you need to remember that his way is the only way you can have victory today. And I just want to encourage you to turn to Christ today and let him lead your life. And, and, and I want to pray for you that you in just a moment. And I also want to be honest for some of us today when I when I look around and survey the social, political, economic landscape around me, it grieves me. It, it, it gives me anxiety at times. Like many of you, I worry about that, you know, when, when, you know, when, when things happen in our nation, it can just get worse and make things worse. But my hope is that for some of you today, this would put some of this in an eternal perspective for you. And that would encourage you that you don't have to compromise. And you also don't have to go forth and conquer. There's a better way. So embrace the hope and encouragement available to you today. So Father, thank you for those that are here today. Thank you for your voice that is heard loud and clear. And I pray that right now for the one who may be pushing against you, pushing back, trying to live life on their own terms, dictate their own rules. They're, they're living life in spirit you know, flagrantly in front of you, uh, offending you and breaking your laws, and it just doesn't seem like a big deal, then in the end, 
they will demonstrate they were a good person or whatever. Lord, please speak to their hearts and, and, and convict their souls that they would know that that's just not how it works. And may you show them your great love and mercy and may they surrender to you and come into a relationship with you whereby you become their Lord and Savior and King and they follow your lead. And we thank you for that. And Lord, today I pray for us because we have many enemies in this world and the world is screaming at us to bow. The world is screaming at us to compromise. The world is telling us we need to stop standing on the things we stand and believing the things we believe. But today we say no, there is a better way. And Lord, we will love those who hate us. We'll pray for those who are against us. We'll bless them and not curse them. And we will show our, uh, by being salty and being light, we will show them our good deeds so that they might give glory to you in all things. Thank you for giving us a better way. We don't have to beat them. We don't have to join them. We're going to go with option three, the way you have called us to live. And we give you glory, thanks, and praise. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise, church. Come on.